All right, hello, Columbia. 3.0 begins now. Excellent, excellent. Fantastic to be here. Thank you, Jaime, and everybody at uh, Columbia 3.0. This is going to be a tremendous day, and my job simply is to set the table. You have fantastic speakers lined up who are going to elaborate on the concept of transmedia storytelling, transmedia narrative, transmedia production. Uh, what I would like to do is kind of shake down the basics, but uh, also um, uh, talk to uh, Colombia specifically about um, the, um, the importance of these new techniques and how they are a bridge between technology and storytelling. Now that storytelling could be entertainment, it could be advertising, marketing, politics, policy, uh, important issues, even here locally in Bogota and Colombia. So I'll be discussing new models for a successful transmedia narrative. Who am I? I am from New York City, Nueva York. Uh, I was born in the early 1960s. And um, <laughs> my, um, um, uh, my brain uh, did not exactly fit into the world into which I was born. In the early 1960s, in the Lower East Side of New York City, there were great difficulties. This was poverty. This was crime. This was enormous uh, strife. And this was cultures clashing with one another, not quite understanding, not even understanding the language uh, in which we all lived. I <laughs> was filled with imagination. <laughs> um, you, you can see that stuff, right? It's out there? Oh, boy. Um, I'm being brave. I'm showing you a picture of me in my underwear. Um, uh, I loved um, the fantasies that would bring power to me because I was powerless in this world. I was born... Uh, with problems. Um, uh, I was a forcep delivery from a very young mother. She was only 15. My face was damaged. And so when I smile, it is a little bit uh, uh, off-center. I have a paralysis on the left side of my face. Um, so instead of um, uh, embracing the, uh, the physical, which kind of rejected me. The boys in the neighborhood, um, even my family, they didn't know what to make of me because I was a reader, I loved mythology, I loved cartoons, I loved dinosaurs, I loved superheroes. And uh, Papi, <laughs> Moreno, de Puerto Rico, we had no connection. He didn't understand anything that I enjoyed. And he was not always happy. Um, so uh, there was great tension and sometimes a great sadness in my home. One day, he said, Jeffrey, come here, look at this on the television. And I came because he very rarely called me. <laughs> um, and I was excited. And he said, look at that. And on television, there was uh, uh, Pedro Mora Morales, Mil Mascaras, and Santo. And they were fighting. There were men with masks, big muscular men fighting each other. It was awesome. Um, he said, Jeffrey, 
sit down on the sofa. Me? <laughs> and I did. And we sat together. And Lucha Libre, for just a few minutes, brought us together. And he saw that I liked it. I didn't like sports. <laughs> Baseball? No. Baloncesto? No. <laughs> I just was not interested. But this was kind of interesting. Until the blood. <laughs> Lots of blood. And I was, ah! <laughs> left the room. <laughs> I was sensitive. Um, but he, he saw a, a kernel, a, a nugget of connection. And one day he brought home a comic book. Santo. And he said, look, here's the character, here's the guy from the, the fighter from the show, Lucha Libre, in a comic book. And I saw it, and he was a superhero. He moved from the television to the book, and it was fantastic. Um, he, um, uh, he, he was very uh, interesting. And then, um, uh, a few months later, we were watching uh, Canal 47, <laughs> and, um, and there was uh, a Santo in a movie on, uh, uh, on the television investigating crime and kicking the ass of the bad guys. Um, I was fascinated because here was a character who was manifesting in different ways on different media, and yet it was him, it was Santo. There were uh, some consistencies to his behavior. He had a code of honor. He had a style that you could see on the different um, uh, media, and, uh, and I really uh, uh, appreciated that and, um, and enjoyed uh, this world that was being uh, created, it seemed just for me. Now, my life uh, didn't suddenly get better. <laughs> it was rough. Um, I would go to school. I would be teased and bullied because of, of my face. Um, uh, growing up different from everyone else. Writing, I loved to write. And, uh, and I was good, I got good uh, grades at, at school. And, uh, and people, this, this is what I experienced. Twisted mouth, freak, broke face, four eyes, I had glasses early, weirdo, fag, I had long hair. Spick from those who were not Latino. And once from my own family, an uncle. He looked at me and I heard what he said to someone else, another relative. Defecto. Defecto. Well, in some ways, I uh, closed the door to my bedroom. I played with my monsters, my army men. I wrote and wrote and wrote and uh, stayed that way in many ways until college. I went to Queens College in Flushing, New York, <laughs> and uh, I discovered there uh, in uh, 1980 a game called Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> um, this was a game that was fascinating to me because I was able to come out from my room and still have make-believe, still have adventures, still tell stories. Dungeons and Dragons is a game about uh, telling a story that's set in a world of fantasy where the other players take on roles so that they could um, participate in the story world. And they go on adventures, slay the dragon, um, rescue the princess, that sort of thing. For me, it was like a fantastic novella. <laughs> um, I would take the, 
um, the, the wishes, the aspirations. I would talk to my players privately and take their fantasies and weave them into uh, the, the world of the adventure. Um, I called that world Corridor, and I made maps, and I uh, talked to the players over the telephone, and I had artists draw pictures of their characters, and we had many, many hours of adventure. Uh, I don't know that we went to school that much in, in college, because we spent a lot of time on Corridor. In 1982-83, I went to one of my players' homes, and he had an Apple II sitting right next to a Trash 80. I don't know if some of you even uh, can remember uh, these machines. But my friend showed me something that fascinated me. On the television screen, there were words. Um, and, uh, and I said, oh, you're writing something? He said, no, somebody else is writing something and sent the words to me through the telephone. And it was an adventure. And they were taking turns typing the, uh, the words back and forth to describe the adventure. Um, and uh, um, it was uh, fun. It was uh, dramatic. Maybe not as dramatic as sitting at a table and having the people right there. But um, I thought to myself, there are so many people who are alone, who don't have people to play with, who don't have people to tell stories with. This is going to be very, very interesting. This is going to solve uh, many problems when it comes to connecting people who are alone. I began to write about it, and I talked about the fact that there are some uh, worlds out there that are interesting because they exist on multiple media platforms. We've all heard about Star Wars. We've all uh, um, watched episodes of Star Trek. Um, uh, the, uh, the fantasy and science fiction uh, tended to spread across uh, different media and I thought one day that we would be able to create narrative content that could do the same thing. It did not have to be an accident. There could be a method to creating story so that it operated across different platforms. And I began to write about it in 1986 um, in Gateways Magazine, which I uh, published off of a Mac Plus with 512K of memory. My writing uh, gathered some attention, and I began to um, uh, be called upon by the gaming industry, because games were where um, this kind of storytelling was being born. Um, so I got to work on Turok Dinosaur Hunter. I created the story. A Nintendo 64, for those of you who grew up in the 90s. Um, and uh, it was incredibly successful, not just because it was a good video game, but because when you went on the internet, there were stories about Turok that I helped to uh, write, and there were uh, comic books uh, about this character. It all took place in the same uh, story world which um, manifested in the video game. Um, this was very successful, and so um, there was a, a, a game called uh, Magica el Encuentro, if anybody remembers that. Um, a trading card game that had uh, pictures of fantasy on the backs of the cards. Um, uh, I had the idea that we can connect these cards, the fantasy, into a story, and the story can manifest in comic books and video games and on the web, even with toys. And, um, and so uh, uh, we did this because of my success on Turok. It was very, very uh, successful. 
Uh, many uh, young people had uh, a great time uh, with uh, Magic the Gathering in the world. Now, I started to be successful. I thought that I had made it. My ideas were working, multi-platform or cross-platform storytelling. What was the response? That's stupid. Pretentious, ridiculous, you're unfocused. You're a fanboy, geek, nerd, sneak, liar, fool. I'm in my 20s. Um, I'm doing things that, that were successful. Some of these words came from my the employees at the company. <laughs> the tall poppy. The tall poppy. You know, you want to uh, kind of hammer it down, huh? Colombians, I think, know a little bit about that. But I had a passion in my heart. I'm not going to let this uh, uh, stop me. I founded uh, a company called Starlight Runner Entertainment in 2000. And the goal was somehow to make a living with cross-platform storytelling. Um, well, in 13 years since then, we've done uh, pretty well. Um, we, we take the intellectual property of a movie or a television show or um, uh, a brand and um, think about how to manifest the story of this thing across different media platforms. And so we become involved with film, television, games, even uh, corporations and social and political uh, endeavors. Um, well, I was so hungry to learn about how things are made on different media platforms that I had a familiarity, of course, with this process, and it helped to combine that with that sense of communal storytelling. So the process for doing this is to determine the essence of the brand, the thing that is in the heart of the story world. Only then can we engender the trust of the visionaries, the people with the money, um, and uh, expand that story world. And um, uh, take different departments, different divisions, technology and creative, and somehow align them behind the franchise. And then we proceed with the production and distribution of the content. One of our earliest projects was Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, we were able to take the intellectual property and uh, let Disney understand that it's not just about Johnny Depp. Pirates of the Caribbean has something interesting to say. It is about the clash of cultures. It is about regimented, um, strict society and the open wilds of the savage wilderness of the Caribbean and how these things crash into one another and create destruction. To take that essence and talk about how important it is to establish balance between these two things allowed Disney to understand the brand better and extend it across these different platforms, even platforms for young children. Transformers, uh, taking uh, a property that had met with success in movie theaters but wasn't selling as many toys as Hasbro would have thought. Why? Because it's maybe not so much about Megan Fox. <laughs> maybe it's a little bit more about transformation, about the changing uh, and the ability to change from one form to another, like what little boys are doing. <laughs> Avatar. There I was in the 1960s 
wearing a cape in my underwear, and now I am standing in Playa Vista, California, working with James Cameron on Avatar, helping 20th Century Fox to understand what seeing means. I see you. Nobody understood this. In order to create good content for Avatar, you must understand the philosophy of the Navi. You cannot only focus on the men with the guns. Very difficult concept to convey. Maybe not entirely successful for part one, but believe me, part two, three, and four will change that focus, transmedia. Can a property that is very successful on one media platform become successful on many? This was the question that Microsoft asked Starlight Runner about Halo. Well, the answer, of course, is in the heart. Who is Master Chief? What is his relationships like? Where is, what is his destiny? Is he just a death machine? Or is he somebody who one day can bring true peace, not just to the galaxy, but to his troubled soul? This is the question that is now starting to be asked in the games themselves. Halo uh, uh, 4, a little bit about that. And this is what resonated with Steven Spielberg, who is now making a Halo television series success. Of course, we all love the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bringing that uh, franchise up to date across different media platforms for Nickelodeon. Men in Black, awesome. Um, uh, can the story world uh, uh, grow and become an evergreen brand? A brand that stays on and on even after the actors have retired? Fascinating question. And Sony liked the answer. The answer, actually, this is a very rare photograph. That is the Men in Black mythology, a photograph of a 300-page document about the universe, the fiction, the story world of Men in Black. With this guide, any division of Sony, any licensee will be able to create content that is consistent with the story world of Men in Black, so that even if uh, the Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones characters are not in the, the story, it will still feel like Men in Black. Sony liked this project so much from us, Starlight Runner, that we became uh, the first company to have a transmedia production and consultation deal in Hollywood. This is for real, people. This happened. Transmedia is becoming uh, highly effective. This is our first project after Men in Black, um, the amazing Spider-Man uh, franchise and story world with Sony. So what is it? There are many definitions for transmedia storytelling. Here is the one uh, that I enjoy. Transmedia storytelling is a technique, people. It's a tool. It's a way of thinking about how to tell a story. It is the process of conveying messages, themes, or storylines to a mass audience through the artful and well-planned use of multiple media platforms. Now, I say artful because I believe that we can move beyond using transmedia to market uh, and simply to advertise. I think we can use a transmedia narrative um, in a way that's beautiful, in a way that is emotionally engaging, in a way that enlightens, delights, and immerses. When you do this well, you will broaden and deepen the relationship to the audience and the loyalty to the franchise. <clears throat> Think of 
each media platform as a musical instrument. We now are capable of creating symphonic narrative, the layering of story from different platforms together to create a new work, a work that reaches the audience from different media touch points. In the old school, you developed your intellectual property for one media, and then more or less it repeated in, in uh, different media after that. In the new school, we are thinking about the intellectual property, the story world, the essence of the brand first. Then we look out at the, the media that we have access to and we design the story in different ways to work that serve the strengths of these different media platforms. In the old school, we went to a movie. If it was very successful, we might read the book. The book was uh, either really good, better than the movie, or not so great, in which case, eh. And some of us, if we are of a certain age, will go out and play the video game of the movie, but of course, that sucked. It was terrible. So the totality of the experience goes from pretty good down, 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 down. Now, what is happening all around the world and will begin to happen here in Colombia is a design sensibility behind the different um, uh, extensions of your story world so that the movie or the TV show um, uh, could uh, be designed in one sense, and then the book is a complement which fits together with the movie or, or TV show, the game the same way. Do you see what I'm saying? So the audience might experience these things not even necessarily in the order in which they are released. It doesn't matter. The audience is smarter today. The audience is savvy. The audience is capable of fitting the pieces together, and if they do fit, oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. We like that the world makes sense in our entertainment, in our fiction, but even in reality. We like connections that make sense. And so, if you are making the extra effort to make these connections for your audience so that they see that it fits together, it's as if you are listening to me. And people, the most powerful thing, the most powerful thing that you can take away from my talk today is the fact that listening is the key. <laughs> because who listens to you? Really, think about it, who? Tu novio? <laughs> tu maestro? <laughs> tu amigo? <laughs> no, <laughs> they're not listening. They're thinking about themselves. The only one who listens to you is tu mama. <laughs> so if you create something that listens to you, it's like having a mama. <laughs> What is the first thing I do? Hey, come check this out. It's listening to me. It's listening to us. And that is how you build audience. Um, the uh, fundamentals, the principles of transmedia storytelling, uh, I devised these some years ago. They still hold up, more or less. So I will uh, share them with you now. Transmedia storytelling is not committee storytelling. We must honor our storytellers, our shaman, because they are rare when they're really good. So the content is created, originated by one or very few visionaries. The rollout is planned early in the life of the franchise. The later 
you start figuring out how it manifests in different media, the more difficult it becomes. The content is distributed to three or more media platforms. Now, some people say, come on, two is like trans. <laughs> and I go, no, it's cheating. <laughs> um, you could make a movie and a website and go, oh, transmedia. No. Um, Look, I, yes, you can. If you're clever, it's, you can make transmedia that way. But uh, I, I like to uh, prevent uh, Hollywood from cheating. <laughs> Three, uh, content is unique, adheres to platform-specific strengths, and is not repurposed from one platform to the next, okay? The different, the mobile app, the, um, uh, the commercial, the print ad, are telling different stories, but combined, it tells a greater story. The content is based on a single vision for the story world. Now, some people say, well, what does that mean? Um, you have many different Batman. <laughs> There's Batman cartoon, Batman uh, um, uh, movies, um, Batman comic books. It's all very different. And I say, that's fine if you're Batman, <laughs> if you are creating something new, something local, you must have consistent uh, narrative. It has to make sense across different um, uh, media or else um, you will have fractures and schisms, contradictions. It doesn't make sense. The audience is very smart and if you have things that don't uh, uh, make sense between the platforms, there's going to be problems. Um, the effort is vertical across the company, across third parties, licensees, um, uh, everywhere. Now, this is difficult, I know. Um, getting people to cooperate is uh, enormously difficult, but that is part of the skill set of the transmedia producer, which we'll talk about. Uh, and finally, it's important to me that uh, transmedia involve um, the audience's participation. Even if it's uh, small, we need this architecture for dialogue. You have to provide a forum to get feedback from the audience. We are fortunate because we live in an age where the technology allows us to take that feedback in many different ways. You need to use that feedback to modify the story. Um, when I was young and The Wizard of Oz was on television, but I was in a car on the Long Island Expressway, tears came down, tears, because I was not going to see The Wizard of Oz that year. <laughs> Right? That's not true anymore, right? We can see The Wizard of Oz whenever we want to, wherever we want to, because the technology allows us uh, to do this. There is no fighting this. It is simply a fact of life. Um, we have to uh, create our narratives to meet the consumer wherever they want, whenever they want. Um, we also have to acknowledge that um, the commercial, the break, it's uh, declining. Um, we're we're um, uh, able more and more to get our content without uh, these breaks, even uh, fast forwarding on the digital uh, video recorder. So um, we have to think of new ways to reach consumers with compelling story. Um, Multiple platforms uh, generate multiple revenue streams and reach audiences where they live, okay? So listen to what I'm saying. Transmedia and monetization. I am not telling you that we have to break what exists in our media infrastructure. It is about shifting the psychology of the media infrastructure into storytelling and dialogue mode, okay? So you're still making money 
the way you always have made money. You simply have to make the story come front and center and make the story the engagement because that's what the audience is going to be looking for from now on. There are other techniques that you will see later today. Um, but I believe we do not have to radically alter the system to make transmedia work. We simply have to work together to make it work. Rich, immersive narrative worlds invite specialists, fans, people who love your work and who will share their love with other people and bring greater audiences to your work. Um, uh, different stories on different media platforms that have the same theme and the same message um, reinforce and become more real to the audience. And um, um, if you let them participate, if you give them a voice, they become very, very loyal to you. Transmedia still creates good publicity, good attention. So yes, transmedia still gives us a way to sell stuff, but it's going to be uh, more than that. It will also be a way for you to assert greater control over your message and over your work because you, as the creator or producer or participant in the construction of the narrative, will need to pay attention to more platforms. It's a little extra work, but if we are doing this extra work, perhaps we should have a little bit greater equity in that work. And transmedia creators are slowly uh, be beginning to uh, be paid more and to become involved more deeply in these projects. Ultimately, transmedia will allow us to express ourselves uh, this is, I believe, a new form of art. Now, technology and the chase never ought to rule over the story, okay? We have seen many uh, experimental uh, transmedia rollouts that uh, believed that because they had a new uh, technological system, because they had... Um, uh, uh, different uh, kind of uh, internet gimmicks and things like that, that people would come even if the story was not that great. It turns out not to be true. Um, story is going to be an engagement with the characters and the, an interest in the characters and what happens to the characters is going to be the primary driver in popular transmedia narrative even if those characters are the audience themselves, okay? So this applies to sports, this applies to news, this applies to uh, documentary. How do we understand what is the most important thing that must manifest on each of these platforms with uh, transmedia technique? You must know in your heart what it is that you are communicating. The whole team must know and agree on what that essence is, okay? So the essence of your brand, your story, are the attributes that distinguish your narrative from competitors or anything that's at all like it. They are what your audience or the consumer connects with when they come into contact with the property. It's the emotional engagement, and, um, and that engagement starts with a vision. What is your brand or story world giving to the audience? Giving to the audience. What is it that you're doing that's going to impact their lives in a positive way? The best and most successful transmedia implementations have had important and affirming messages. Sometimes they are warnings about uh, things like um, uh, the fact that oil is, is running out or, or that global uh, climate change is, is going to uh, be a, a horrific uh, situation for us. But that warning is something that will make human lives better. 
Um, you must think about that, even if what you're selling is soap. <laughs> um, so what question does it answer? Theme, okay? It is one thing to be inspirational, but even more important is a message that makes us want to take some kind of action. Um, you'll hear today many times that the call to action is vital in transmedia storytelling uh, because the call to action will move the audience member from one medium to the next to enjoy a different aspect of the story, a complementary aspect. So um, uh, it's not just about getting to the next part of the story. It's um, something that makes me feel good, that makes me want to do something that is going to be vital in your implementation. Um, think about the myth. Think about the core elements in what it is that you are talking about with your communication. Um, those fundamental primal chords that you are going to hit with your uh, implementation, the archetype, um, are what will connect your audience to your brand. When you find out what these things are, when you uh, collectively agree on what they are, then these things must be infused into the different communications on the different media platforms. That's how we will tell that this is your communication, that collectively it belongs to the same story world. So, the five elements for good transmedia narrative. Number one, does it have something to say, something potent, something human, okay? You can't just have an idea that bounces from one media platform to the next. It has to be substantial, not a joke, okay? Comedy is fine. There are wonderful, funny transmedia universes like The Simpsons or South Park. Um, uh, but um, uh, just one little funny bit is not enough to get your audience to jump across these different uh, uh, platforms. I said aspirational, but your character doesn't always have to be a good guy. He has to be, or she has to be, compelling. Um, they have to yearn to struggle um, and uh, triumph from face to feet. Oh my God. I have OCD, and that's a misspelling. <laughs> Ivan Asquith did this yesterday and got into big trouble. All right. <laughs> All right. Hook me with a good character that I like or identify with, and I will follow her anywhere. So important. Story elements that are self-contained but additive. This is, uh, this is beautiful. Um, uh, this is a, a, a true, unique, I believe, component to transmedia storytelling because you are creating an addition, right, that is not a part of uh, the movie or, or television show. It's something separate um, and complete. It has a beginning, middle, and end, this app or, or this short story or, or what have you. But in reading it, in enjoying it, it throws new light onto the greater story world. It gives me new insight into what is happening in the other parts of the narrative. Um, this is very, very uh, interesting and challenging for the transmedia artist. Finally, the work leverages the strength of each medium it uses, okay? So, for a teenager, the mobile phone, that's like their bedroom. You do not go into the bedroom, <laughs> okay? If you go into the bedroom, you had better have something directly important to the teenager to have to say. So they are trusting you to come into their phone. So you must be intimate, you must be personal, and it has to be uh, directly engaging uh, to the uh, user of, of that phone. If you get this wrong, the teenager is going to throw you out of the bedroom and you cannot come back in. 
You have to be very careful and think about the strengths and weaknesses of the different media that you're using. Then there is individuated content, okay? This is coming like a tidal wave across the entire world. What is individuated content? It is the use of your own equipment, your mobile phone, your movie camera, your, your um, uh, devices to create new content that you yourself post on Instagram or YouTube or any uh, uh, social media platform. Now, why is everyone scared of individuated content? Well, because a lot of it has nothing to do with the, tele, uh, with the media, with big media. A lot of it has nothing to do with the big movies or TV shows or, or music. It is an expression of the personal uh, uh, creativity of the people creating the individuated content. Um, what do we do about this? Well, um, there are thousands of uh, YouTube videos of Littlest Pet Shop. <laughs> these toys from Hasbro, these little animal toys, where you could see the fingers manipulating the uh, characters, and uh, they're having uh, drama, <laughs> like uh, soap opera, like novella. <laughs> Um, uh, and some of these are getting tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of hits. What is Hasbro doing about Littlest Pet Shop videos? Very little, almost nothing, almost nothing. So there you have to um, uh, think about how you can give your assets to the, the public and let them play, let them play with your content. Um, in doing so, you will seep out into the culture. Will some of it be negative? Sure, that happens. But a lot of it will be positive because you've given them something to play with and you stand for integrity and positivity and, uh, and good things. Um, so, there you go. That's uh, a nine-year-old girl shooting a horror film on the New Jersey shore. <laughs> my daughter, <laughs> with an iPhone. And she will post it on uh, YouTube, and, um, and there are no uh, movies or TV shows or pop stars in this film. It is created just by these little girls, which I think is pretty cool. There are new sources for transmedia projects. We've seen apps become... Uh, 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 multi-platform uh, successes. Uh, Moshi Monsters is moving across different media platforms. There are digital companies, some of which are in South America, Evergreen is in uh, Los Angeles, that are creating their own intellectual property and rolling them out on different media platforms without the aid of Hollywood or big money. Um, they have private investors or um, uh, they're um, uh, working amongst themselves to uh, incubate and launch transmedia uh, properties. Entertainment companies are building now story worlds out of their most important intellectual properties. Now, so will businesses, okay? Um, corporate narratives are becoming more and more important. It is the essence of your business in action. It is derived from elements that have made uh, the corporation successful or the product successful. Um, they basically must take their vision, their ethos, their founding principles, which, by the way, have to be positive, okay? This is the beauty of the corporate narrative in the transmedia space. We see you, we see you, and we talk about you, and there are many, many more of us now than there are of you. You, Mr. Corporation, used to control the narrative. You owned the media and the story. We only controlled a tiny bit, our voices, our letters. That's it. Now, now we control 
most of the pie. When something happens of significance, it becomes enormously written about in social media. The corporation becomes rapidly overwhelmed. The corporation must respond. They have to. And often, they are responding by having to correct something, by having to fix something, by having to become honorable, <laughs> to have integrity. Well, why not start from, from integrity? Why not um, talk with the corporation about what it stands for and then create the messages, the themes, the aspirational elements from there that will um, be given to the world through their actions, through their products, and through their services, okay? Because only then will they be perceived by the world positively. You can sit there and tell me, ah, oh, there are companies in Bogota who, that are not going to do that. And I say, soon they will be left behind because we have control of social media. Um, they will have to catch up. They will have to stand up a tiny bit straighter in order to withstand the scrutiny of the people. Starlight Runner is getting more and more corporate um, uh, clients. We uh, worked with Pepperidge Farm and the Goldfish Crackers, um, and the uh, results were very, very positive. We talked about different ways to look at the brand essence to allow uh, goldfish market to widen so it's not just little kids, it's uh, everyone because we all will enjoy goldfish at one point or another in our lives and the communication will be tied into a new uh, and uh, innovative brand essence. Of course, there are now more and more major transmedia projects. Um, the new Star Wars um, is going to have uh, fascinating transmedia components. Uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe um, is uh, uh, created in such a way that uh, it was planned ahead of time that these movies would somehow be connected and that uh, the other media, like the S.H.I.E.L.D. television show, would become a part of the integrated story world. Um, even in publishing, there are efforts now underway to integrate the fiction that is written by fans um, uh, so that we can enjoy different stories uh, about our favorite characters. Some of that might even become canonical, might become a part of the official universe of vampire diaries or, or things like that. Um, even low-budget uh, uh, television shows uh, in, in Canada and South America are utilizing transmedia techniques, inexpensive techniques. Uh, Starlight Runner worked on Battle Castle, which was uh, a, a few episodes long, but included uh, uh, motion comics, games, um, uh, 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 a Twitter feed, Facebook, um, uh, tours of the castles on the web, uh, all for um, uh, just over a, a six-figure number, like. Um, a very inexpensive implementation. So what do I get? What is the reward <laughs> for working on this concept of a transmedia storytelling? Sell out, Hollywood shill, misguided. Oh, transmedia, nobody cares about that word. It's going away, it's fading. Yesterday's news, let's see what's next. Oh, and also, I get a lot of nerd, geek, spick, fag, defecto. <laughs> My point is, people, it's not going away. <laughs> when you are innovating, when you are doing something new, you're going to meet with resistance. Learn as much as you can today, um, because you're going to go back to work um, in a day or two, and if you want to do these things, you're going to meet with resistance, but the rewards, people, the rewards are that you might meet R2-D2. <laughs> no, no, the rewards are that you will be a part of a wave, uh, a part of an innovation 
that is going to change the face of the world. Um, it's an innovation that is growing and becoming more and more um, uh, applicable. Um, you remember uh, El Santo and Lucha Libre. Well, there is to this day uh, a Mexican Lucha Libre AAA league. And um, um, I have been approached, Starlight Runner was approached, to create a global franchise around Lucha Libre that will traverse all media platforms. It is being um, uh, uh, overseen by Comcast, by uh, a new uh, cable television channel called El Rey, and we will get to create the story world and become deeply involved in reimagining the characters for a multi-platform uh, in the United States and around the world. Hola, papi. <laughs> Um, and, um, and by the way, royalties. We get back end, baby. You're going to get back end. You will be able, if you're a transmedia producer, to essentially benefit from your talent, your capabilities, your ability to traverse all these different uh, personalities and platforms to sew together um, a, a, a story and then you should be rewarded for it. So start from the beginning, baby steps. It took me a long time. But you have to be unstoppable. You cannot allow the tall poppy to be cut down. Okay? Do the extra work of serving your brand essence, your story world, above all other interests and make all stakeholders feel supportive, incentivized. You must give, you must nurture, and expand and engage transparently with the audience. There is one more application I have not talked about, and that is um, that stories can affect change. Um, these are not the stories that are told to us, but those that we share. You have seen this here in this city over the past week, okay? We can use transmedia techniques to open people's eyes. It has happened in Colombia in amazing ways with the use of Facebook, with the use of Twitter, with the use of the stories of the people that have come with such poignancy, with such emotion, in such a compelling way that the powers that be, even the opponents, had to lay down their arms and start talking, okay? That is the core, the start of a new type of communication a transmedia communication that can be used to unite and to develop peace. It is a new methodology. El ahorro de nuestro mundo de la pendiente condenación vendrá no a través de la adaptación complaciente de la mayoría conforme, pero a través de la inadaptación creativa de una minoría disconforme. We are the determiners of our lives, and we are the salvation of the people who are suffering, who need wisdom, who need not to be alone anymore. These are resources because we've only going to scratch the surface today. Um, uh, the others will give you more. But I am your resource, me. 
This is how to contact me if you have questions, if you'd like to talk further, if you want to make a connection with someone in the transmedia space, I welcome you. I will help you. Give me some time because sometimes it's hard. <laughs> I'm very busy, but I will respond to you. Thank you very much. We'll answer questions at the end of the day, I think. Thank okay. you so much, Jeff. All right.